Sarah, welcome to the Creation for Liberation podcast. So excited to have you here. Thank you, Chetna. Excited to talk with you. Yes. So I'm beginning to start with this question, given that we are here on the Creation for Liberation podcast. And liberation is this beautiful abstract concept, practice, felt sense that may mean different things to each of us, but also may mean very similar things to each of us. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, perhaps in this moment, what does liberation feel like in your body? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? What does it feel like or sound like? Mm. Liberation is sharing and music and the flow of vibration and balance yeah the absence of shame and doubt liberation mm -hmm. is energetic <laughs> and mm -hmm. free mm -hmm. yeah there's something in hearing you say the flow of music in response to this question that just feels so present and so relevant um, just in terms of how each of us can access the flow of music through taps <laughs> of like maybe two buttons on our phone or computer mm -hmm. or just how accessible music is um, and how at any moment we can choose to really tap in and like sink into it if we choose to if we're mindful with it. Yes. And it's within our bodies. And I think of the whole, all of our energetic pathways as music and melodies going this way and that. So like the unblocking of those pathways also brings music to the mm. world. It can be shared and heard and go yeah. back. Yeah. You know, I've been learning Bansuri, as you know, as my friend, we've jammed together. And the other day, I've been learning it for a year, and I've been very in the in the weeds with like learning the rags and trying to be meticulous with my finger positioning. And it's like hyper young energy, like very do it right, kind of like do it the way you are taught. But for the first time, the other day, my teacher left me off saying, go make some music, just go make some music. And for some reason that just hit so deeply because I guess I'm at this place now and I, maybe I always was. Uh, and yes, I think I always was because even blowing a note into the flute can be music and is music, right? But to realize that we can make music at any point in time, like, and we are making music through our conversation through our humming in the shower through even listening to the birds and whatnot so yeah there's something about making music not it just in the literal sense of being an artist or being a musician um, in an exclusive kind of way but how accessible that liberation is yes 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 and it's like uh, we talked about the relationship that you're in with the flute and a relationship can't go anywhere if it's just about control or building blocks like it has to be about listening and giving and you know I have been in a relationship with the banjo for many years and a lot of it was exactly it's like you said like eh, I'm trying to do it I'm trying to make my hands do this I'm trying to make it happen in a certain way but then there's these times where I'm just with the banjo and it's soothing my soul mm. and that's really why I'm playing it and it's just such a nice reminder that it's like oh no I'm just we're here together like I'm in relationship with you mm. and again it's 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 unlocking like the vibrations of the banjo are unlocking the blocked places and often allow for emotion to come out and so yeah, when we're singing to ourselves or making music of any kind or talking with others, it's like just generating this energy that allows for new possibilities. Yes. 
I'm so excited for this conversation with you because we're going to get more into making music and being in collaboration with not only the music, but also the instrument and everything on the earth that has supplied tool or material for the instrument through a journey that you've gone on to make a karar. Did I say that right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> as far as I can instruct, that is how, how I would say it, yes. So tell us, Sarah, what um, what instigated you to going from being a banjo player for so long and touring and performing and doing a lot of really beautiful things in the community as a banjo player and more and a musician to wanting now to go on this journey of making a karar? Well, I think I always knew that my affinity for the banjo was related to the krar. So they're different. So the krar is like a harp or a lute instrument. So the strings come down the center from a crossbar. They're not against a fretboard. So the notes that you will play would just be the notes that it's tuned to. Whereas on the banjo, you're moving your hand to make different notes along the fretboard. But the sound is similar. And I think I just <laughs> was hearing the crar in the banjo, or I have a whole other relationship with the banjo that comes from some other mystical place. But the crar is an Ethiopian or Eritrean instrument. And my dad is from Eritrea. Uh, my mom is American. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot to the story of my <laughs> connection to our heritage, being first generation, a lot to how culture was or was not passed down or how I resisted absorbing it for various reasons, um, because maybe it wouldn't be the full authentic picture and I would fall short of my Eritrean-ness, <laughs> which makes it harder to even step into the waters. So for many years, I said, you know, this banjo will bring me back to the Krar, but it, it's not yet. And mm. so, yeah, and the last year has been a real journey of letting go of a lot of old ways of being and welcoming in new resources. And I started to really look for look to my Eritrean heritage or my my grandmother <laughs> who's passed, but sort of asking her, what do I need to be able to mother myself in a different way? What do I need? For this next phase of life to welcome love in a more full way um, rather than like rejecting this other stuff that didn't work like bring me something new bring me <laughs> bring me the resources that I know that I have and so in asking for that the answers I got were in the real tactile things like cooking like <laughs> roasting coffee and like hearing the sound of that and um, chopping onions, you know, and the rhythm of that, the smell, and of course, leading to the music and the rhythm of the music, the language. So, yeah, so there I was, like, I want to feel this intelligence, this cultural intelligence that feels far away, but I know is inside of me already through my DNA, through my history. I want to find it. I want to touch it. I want to sense it. And it just became clear that that was going to come from not like an intellectual place, but through this doing with my hands and repetition and cooking and chopping and singing and you know smelling and all of that this is something like I may not have known before but I'm one person on the earth and I can reclaim my culture any way that I want and it doesn't matter that I'm coming here as a beginner like I'm a beginner in so many ways so I asked my dad to put his ear to the ground and see where I could get a Krar in the Bay Area. And he, so he found one for me that um, a guy had made in Oakland. So I started playing that and 
different songs came up and I was drawn to Jamaica. I felt like I needed to go to Jamaica for whatever reasons. Find out when I get there. And there's a banjo maker there who also makes crars. And he's a beloved friend of another woman who was really responsible for bringing a beautiful community together of banjo players and people who are interested in the African roots of the banjo. Mm. So through this network of soul tribe people, <laughs> I ended up there with the possibility of maybe making a crar. Yeah, just the courage that it takes to go somewhere and not know what's there for you yet and be in the uncertainty and the mystery of it, I think is such a portal to so much when we can cross the threshold. Yeah. It. Um, and so tell us about, tell us about what your process was like in Jamaica. I'll also say for those who are listening uh, as a podcast on audio, I highly recommend going to YouTube because we will be sharing some images to supplement what Sarah is saying uh, that will really give you a peek into her world as she connected with the land and crafted this instrument. So check it out on the tube. Tell us, Sarah. Yeah, so I don't know if I was specifically going there to make a crar, but it was out there in the thought process. And it was something I told people because it was just easier to have a reason. Like, why are you going? Oh, well, I'm doing this or I might do that. Where in the back of my mind, I'm like, I just, I'm supposed to go. I'll find out later. So, and I knew it had something to do with connecting to my roots. So it's like, well, why would you go to Jamaica to connect with Eritrea? Well, I don't know. Moral field. <laughs> You know, oh, you're going to make a crar with, with this maker? Is he is he Ethiopian? Is he Eritrean? No. Well, why would you go <laughs> work with it? I don't know. More will be revealed, you know? And so just saying yes and, and going, and it's like there's lessons there for me. Again, I had been like training that yes muscle to just go when, you know, signs come up or things are recurring or, um, you know, just to listen to that. So yeah, so I ended up on the south coast of Jamaica in a small fishing village. And I realized once I was there that there were so many odd similarities actually to like my dad's village. Like I was in a very dry place with goats running around. <laughs> and like I would send my dad a picture and he's like, oh, that looks like that looks like the village, you know, that looks like back home. So it was interesting connections that way. Jamaica as a country definitely feels like Africa West, like it's a really powerful place for Black liberation also. And um, yeah, and I can't say I, I experienced all what the country had to offer, but this little piece <laughs> in this little town, I was there for a couple of months and just getting in the rhythm. Mm. And at the very end, it was time to make the instrument. <laughs> wow, so it took you a few months just to settle in and get present and connected in the community on the land before you actually started to make the instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes and I think that was a huge part of being ready. Yeah. And there was a lot of support there at that point of people who were ready to witness the journey and witness the birthing of this instrument. Yeah. Being that you were going through Conscious Creators, the four-month program at the beginning of this year, myself and the cohort also got to witness the unfolding in the ways that we could at the touch points that we had. And you shared the image of you on your laptop with your headphones on and all these goats around you and just the juxtaposition of, you know, being connected through a community, our community on tech and whoever else you're connecting to, um, yet being in this very unique place that is 
so powerful for black liberation that reminds you of your dad's village um that you came to because you were following the i don't know more will be revealed <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you will so yeah that that bridge between between two worlds just felt really really juicy and powerful yeah and i mean it was just a lot about just letting letting go letting go letting go shedding because um you know it wasn't a place with amenities <laughs> there was like you know i was constantly under attack from the little micro organisms like ants and mosquitoes and the water would go out for a couple days and you know there was um hardship in that way not necessarily for me as someone who was popping in and out but definitely um for those living there long term but what you discover in places um like this is there's also an incredible resource from the from the culture from the people from how they interact how they care for each other um how they renew their spirit so you know letting go of the things that seem like comfort that actually are limiting <laughs> in a lot of ways and stepping in to a place where it requires a lot more faith but there's incredible gifts as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is related in a small way, though largely unique in and of itself. Um, I'm thinking, as I hear you talk about the resilience of cultural spirit being present, even in hardship, that's very tangible and real. I'm just thinking about you know, uh, how Ramadan has passed and how folks in Gaza have found ways in the ways that were even remotely accessible to gather and dare I say even rejoice in the food that was accessible to break fast or just mm -hmm. in one another's company despite like all that was happening and is happening still right just really speaking to a larger thing around it's stunning it's like it makes me want to cry just in terms of how um, yeah, how resilient this culture is, and it shouldn't have to be this resilient, you know, like this, um, but how resilient culture and tradition and ritual and spirit and God, whatever that is to whoever mm -hmm. how it lives on so strongly, despite all that's happening. So just wanted to name that here. Mm -hmm. um, Points to what, what matters most. What are the things that are going to sustain you? So if you know that it's keeping your cultural tradition and faith is is the thing and it's nothing else <laughs> then yeah you're gonna you're gonna go for that and yeah I mean it's just such a powerful connection to um to that place and that land a lot of my contemplations like leading into you know when I talk about the food it's like I was singing about dates and honey wine and olive oil and pomegranates and it's like these things were just a precursor to the October conflict, but I just thought, wow, like this song came to me because I would need it soon. Wow. <laughs> you know, and um just realizing that those are those are things that help get right. us through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And even just what you were saying, just dates, honey wine, pomegranates, like each one has such meaningfulness, such symbolism, such um, prosperity associated with it, you know, um, mm -hmm. indulgence will that, yeah, becomes such a savored and precious gift. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. So cool. Tell us about what were some of the only some, right? Because we can only speak to so much here. What were some of the lessons that you would like to share in your process of making the Karar? So many, so many, so many. So I was working with um, a gourd banjo maker, Jeff Menzies, who has an instrument um, building um, practice and business. 
Um, so he would help me with the technical aspects, the machines and the joints and stuff like that. And I was in charge of the artistry, I guess you could say, although we were working together at each point. So there was a lot about collaborating <laughs> that I, that was learned and that was very beautiful actually. And one of his gifts is just giving permission. So he was someone who is like, yeah, it could be that way. It could be that way, mm. or we could do it this way. And then if that doesn't work, we'll find out why and we'll do another one, you know? So oh. that was great <laughs> to be around, right? Cause I was just having trouble even starting because there was so much writing on this moment and this instrument and all the pathways that led me there. And so I I'm just phrase, yeah. like one of his gifts is to give permission. Like, I love that you phrase it that way because to give permission in a process is whatever the process is, whether it be instrument making or just being <laughs> um, in relationship or in life is such a gift. It's such a gift. So to hear you phrase it that way, it feels really, really lovely. And yeah, I'm, I'm receiving that. And I hope people receive that as a worthy gift um, to offer somebody as such a worthy gift that then births so many more creations that we just couldn't even right. anticipate. Yeah. 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 And, and so there was things that it meant like letting go of hi hierarchies, I think I mentioned to you the hierarchy of the wood, <laughs> like the different wood and materials that that we could have used. So, you know, I had choices at every turn. Every Everything is, the field is huge of like how something could end up. And to look at images of different crars, like they look all different ways. Um, there's different like values built into how they look. Like, do you want your, the arms to be polished and straight or do you want them to be organic and shaped, you know, irregularly? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can't say, oh, I want it the one authentic way that it's done because everything is built out of the context of the moment. Mm. so that's permission okay I'm here today I'm in this location with this other person with these materials so what's going to be born in this context and that's that's it it'll be what it is <laughs> and it would, it would be something different if it was at a different time place or whatever okay so we move forward yeah but yeah, that's a big deal. <laughs> Tell us about the um, the choices. Like I imagine, yeah, permission giving was fundamental in you being able to make the quote unquote right choice for you in the context of the moment at each step from the wood that you chose, from how you cut the thing or what you put on the, so yeah, share more about. Yeah, so one of the first things I like really, decided was that I wanted to use found wood and um there is a lot of like brush and bush and people are chopping and clearing land to make way for farmland and stuff like this and so you'll see a lot of like um piles before they're burned of stuff <laughs> but yeah so you know passing one of these piles I was like oh okay that could be a, a source, you know, or, you know, ran it by Jeff and he's like, yeah, why don't you use this or go take a walk over here and grab something. So, so then I'm like, okay, well, what should I think about how thick or thin, you know? So there were like technical aspects, ah, it should be around in here, but, and like kind of straight. Okay. So, <laughs> so, you know, so I got my wood, you know, a couple splinters walking through the village, carrying this stuff. Everyone's like, what in God's name is she doing? Um, <laughs> Well, I was going to make a cook fire. That was the logical thing that I was going to do with that wood. Um, but I brought it back. I shaved it down. I pulled the bark off, sanded it, 
So I'm already like starting to get in the rhythm and hear the sound and the feeling of like working with this material. Um, and picked three pieces that looked like they would want to go together, two arms and a cross bar. And then the other main piece is the pot. So again, like this has been made a lot of different ways over time being that I was with a gourd banjo maker, a gourd was one option. He also had a coconut ring, a ring scraped out from a coconut trunk, which is really a fiber, not a wood, I guess. <laughs> so I was working with that for a little while. And then there was some epiphany where it was like, no, it has to be the gourd. What are you talking about? That's why I came here. I love the gourd. It's like a symbol. And it was showing up in all of my cards so I make I make collage cards and so I started pulling cards and all the ones I pulled had some kind of calabash or gourd or whatever so then I say oh okay reroute <laughs> and that's an example of like saying yes and it could have been the other way but like something's telling me it should be this way yeah it was this dance between like accepting what is and what's coming to you and then sometimes having to block all that out and say like, no, this is the thing that I, is meant to come. <laughs> and that was such an interesting thing to get used to listening for. Mm -hmm. Like what is my gut and intuition? Because it's actually, I have other things guiding me and I, it, there's a mission for this <laughs> mm -hmm. instrument in my life versus it could be anything and we'll just accept it and love it. So those are both and. Yeah. Yeah. Like the both and of collaborating with the materials, with the land, like you even said, as you were putting the, the found branches, if you will, together, you were, you were like, which three wanted to go together? <laughs> it's like you're asking them what what feels good for you, right? Which is such a collaboration. But in any collaboration that is effective, we can't forget ourselves and our intuition and our needs in it. And so I'm hearing you also placing yourself, locating yourself in the midst of all the other guidance uh, that's at play. Mm -hmm. dance it's so complex it's hard to even break it down how to do it because it's each moment in each context calls for a different sway it's the self and it's also the self as a vessel for something else so like if I'm in service to some mysterious <laughs> thing soul purpose maybe um, then I'm responsible for that. And I'm responsible for saying yes to that and blocking other options out. And what's really great is when there's an option to try again <laughs> or get it right the second time. And, you know, right and wrong is, is the myth, but like we, we got into something about the goat skin, which was another major part of this instrument. Everything's alive, but, you know, a goat isn't animal being um, very sacred um loving gift to give and to to have and receive and um yeah so the goat skins all look different and they'll look different once their um um coat is removed and once they're soaked and once they're stretched so it's like I'm having to pick which one to use not knowing how it's going to look in the end, the, the dried skins, I'm kind of like going through them like a library. So then the, um, Jeff had to scrape off the fur and I'm like, oh, there's scrape marks on it now. What are you doing? Why is this happening? Ah! <laughs> okay, let's go to lunch. And you know, it is like, so just wanted to ask you like, why did you mess up my gold skin? You know? <laughs> He's like, what do you mean? That's how I've been trained to do it. And I was following the path of the hair, et cetera, et cetera. 
Mm. So we tried a different goat skin, but it didn't want to be on this instrument. I don't know how else to say it. It wasn't the one. Mm. So we went back to the original one. And it was that was a lesson about acceptance and dialogue and understanding and waiting and finding out later. Mm -hmm. But these are like heightened, these are like heightened emotional moments, right? Like. <laughs> mm -hmm. But through trust and dialogue and learning and then that, yes, like that was the one that wanted that I picked, you know? So now my mind was getting involved, like, but it's imperfect or it's no longer perfect or it's been damaged. And it's like, well, aren't you, aren't I like, why would that be a reason <laughs> to toss it? Like, don't I have scars as well? Like, you know, and then it's like, well, I can accept that, but others will be looking at this and they'll say, why did this happen? And you know, you have to get through all of that. <laughs> it's so deep, really. Like, yeah, I can see why you were like, why did you mess it up? It's the sacred special goat skin. Like, yeah, you had several to choose from, but also like, this is a goat skin. Like, we can't just toss it now, you know? There's like some scarcity around that or just some very real limited thing that you want to use the resources that you've chosen um yes and it would have yeah. been used on a different banjo okay because mm -hmm. he has a different threshold for quote-unquote perfection he's like oh <laughs> this is this is magic and that's just the the mark of the maker that you see and wow. we're, we're here you know like they're all gonna be some way yeah and he knew that but I didn't because it's my first one you know so I was having to catch up to all these deep life lessons mm. and there wasn't a ton of time because I had a flight in a week mm. <laughs> out of there yeah but you comparing that imperfection and like the scars that we all have and how this instrument reflected it in a way or the marks of the maker um yeah that's really that is so beautiful of just like how we perhaps treat our bodies and the fear we have of how other people see our bodies even if there's to some degree a knowing that we are just the way that we are and that's beautiful and how it's supposed to be, right? Um, yeah, there's so much connection mm -hmm. there. So much. I had a dream where I was like, I woke up and I like, I was the shape of the instrument. Like my legs were going out, like the arms of the instrument and the pot, like a, it's of course like the belly, you know? So yeah, it's a body. Wow you know yeah. and it very intentionally mimics our bodies probably at first when you showed us an image of a process photo it looked like a vagina with the fallopian tubes it's a triangle it's a beautiful womb yeah. uterus triangle yeah um from which music plays <laughs> and sound emerges and life emerges and breath what other lessons did you learn as you began to put the finishing touches on your karar in your last bits of time in Jamaica hmm. well there was a beautiful like passage or ceremony where there were people who wanted to see this instrument after it had been made so on the last night before we left, we got together and it was like a farewell party, but it was really a like welcome party for this instrument. Mm. And yeah, there was a lot of magic that happened there just as it was coming to life. The town I was in was in drought and just like the ground was begging for rain, the, the animals, the trees. Um, and just as we were putting the strings on and playing the crar for the first time, this huge rain came. And it was so, so beautiful to see. And it just felt so good to like <laughs> welcome it that way and cleanse from the process and yeah, just be affirmed in some way. Um, 
so we had this amazing rain and then we had a little circle gathering to say hello to the new instrument. And that's why I went there. <laughs> so more was revealed, but more will be, you know, in how I haven't really got to play the instrument yet. I left it there to mm. be shipped later. It felt like it wasn't time to take it out of its place <laughs> and it crashed around and like dissed by airline folks and I just was like oh I can't I can't carry this right now um yeah so that's another chapter that's coming mm. yeah more will be revealed mm -hmm. Um, do you want to share anything about the role of conscious creators or creative somatic alchemy in your process? Oh my gosh. I mean, the group of masterminds that we had really helped me discover gentleness and acceptance and help just open up and say yes to things that want to be made. And it was a place to really play with those ideas like head on. Because I was really like, well, nature's doing its thing. Why would we interrupt it by creating something out of it? <laughs> and it's like, whoa, no, but how do you know? Like, maybe it wants to be shaped. It wants to be changed. That's how we're giving gratitude. That's how we're showing love. You know, like just even those little things that I was thinking about, like there was a place to dialogue about them through creative somatic alchemy and um, conscious creators. Uh, and there were um, people who I knew were holding me along this journey and were also these like infused beings to help me along. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it was an amazing space of support. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of connecting back to like locating ourselves in nature, like nature is doing its beautiful thing. And how can we interact with it, be in relationship to it? And as creators, as conscious creators, we are inevitably in relationship to it. And how do we be in collaborative relationship to it? How do we be, how do we be in reverent relationship to it? How do we amplify its beauty by creating instrument that becomes liberation and the flow of music? And yeah, you absolutely did that. And I'm so grateful to have been able to witness part of your process. Thank you for sharing it with us. Is there anything else you want to share before we close for today? I'm just thinking of a song that's about that, that I think I shared with you all in CSA. Maybe I'll just sing a snippet of it. <laughs> there is a song within you running through my veins gentle insistent rolling waves what can i give you only to melt in your arms or shape you and thank you creating something new <sighs> thanks sarah mm.